Hello, and welcome to my presentation on minority language media in Europe and the COVID-19 pandemic, a study of 10 linguistic spheres. Uh, yeah, so my name is Craig Willis. I am a junior researcher at the European Centre for Minority Issues, and I'm also a PhD student at the Europa University in Flensburg, both in Germany. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you guys in in Novi Sad and online, and um, it's a shame that uh, we can't be there in person. Um, nonetheless, I would like to present to you the findings of a study, um, ongoing study that has been conducted by myself and my colleague, Dr. Sergio Spoba at the ECMI, in which we focused on um, 10 linguistic spheres uh, of minority languages across Europe. Uh, and so these were, as you can see on the slide, Welsh, German and Latin in South Tyrol, Basque, Irish, Catalan, German in Denmark, Swedish in Finland, Frisian uh, in the Netherlands, German in Poland and Scottish Gaelic in, in Scotland. Um, these were not chosen uh, specifically to be representative. It was more of a pragmatic uh, choice of where we knew people. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more on that um, on, when we move to the next slide. Um, so, yes, yeah, so basically it wasn't a pre panned list and we we know that it's not representative of the entire continent, um, but it does give us a bit of a, a bit of a mix um, on private, public sector institutes, minority languages with and without a kin state, a numerical size difference. So we have Catalan media spoken uh, consumed by hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and then we have smaller languages down into the tens of thousands. Um, in terms of exactly what we were focusing on, um, we were looking at the effects of the lockdowns uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic in the first wave, so broadly March until June 2020. Um, and we are also looking at both positive and negative aspects um, by which we divided our interviews into six questions on the same six questions across each of the of the 10 spheres covered. So this began asking for a summary introduction of the minority language media situation and institutions covering a little bit on history um, and what institutions exist. So TV, radio, um, newspapers, uh, etc. and also social media. Um, and this obviously varies greatly per sphere. Some spheres have all of these outlets, types of outlets, and some um, maybe just have one minority newspaper. So there's a big variance there. We then asked how the COVID pandemic has affected the reporting of minority language media um, and, and what effect there has been on readership or audience figures more broadly as well as financial implications. Um, and then we broaden this out to look at how the, what the effects of the lockdowns were on other content, like non-news related content. Uh, then our next question was on majority minority relations or how the situation of minorities has been covered in majority media. Then we look at a uh, practical um, perspective of day-to-day of -day work uh, and implications on, on the institutions or outlets. And then finally, a question on social media and how this has played out. The answers were very varying, as was to be expected, given that the spheres are of varying um, in size. And so my next um, slides will really follow this pattern of the six questions um, and provide you with uh, 
sort of an overview of our findings. So firstly, uh, here's a slide that I put together of the logos of many of the media outlets or institutions which are covered. Um, not all, but, but most from the 10 spheres. Some of them will be probably familiar to you, particularly the, the newspapers that are members of Midas, um, but also you have some substantial uh, TV companies in there, etc. Um, so moving on to the first uh, question, or the first, first set of findings, um, audience figures and funding implications. What we found um, in many instances is that audience figures had increased, often by a significant percentage. Um, and where there wasn't any audience figures, it was usually um, figures not existing rather than lower audience figures. Um, and a particular increase appeared to be in relation to news items, uh, which possibly reflects the local nature of the pandemic and sort of the minority's desire to receive detailed updates in their mother tongue. Um, one remark uh, from one of the expert interviewees suggested that normally big headline events draw minorities to national level majority language media. Uh, so we think of um, natural disasters or big political events. Um, but with the pandemic, despite being a real global phenomenon, which has affected almost everywhere, this, this shift didn't happen. In, instead, there was a reverse. And so people turned to minority media. Um, and this, this theory behind this is potentially that the pandemic has most significant effects on a local or regional level. And so minorities want to know what's happening in their area um, in terms of lockdown measures, but also in terms of case numbers. And so this is possibly why the pandemic has helped to increase audience figures, particularly in news. So a few examples here listed on the slide where they, we were given quantified figures of, of increase, um, TV channels, newspapers in different spheres. Um, also, another aspect was that social media engagement and digital content really increased in terms of numbers and audience figures, but I will discuss this in more detail in the social media slide. Um, so yeah, broadly our finding here is that audience figures increased during, during the lockdown period for, for most spheres. However, at the same time, um, there was reduced advertising revenues. And this was finding which uh, reoccurred in many different situations, um, particularly for minority language media who are in the private sector or part with a sort of part financed by uh, subsidy and advertising. Um, and every time this was brought up, it was in the context of this becoming potentially an existential threat if normal levels of advertising revenues do not resume. Um, and so despite this um, reduction in advertising revenues, and alongside uh, audience figures going up, it seems that there's some kind of disparity here. And we think it's probably advertising revenues have dropped just because other businesses really uh, were affected by the economic lockdowns um, in terms of what needs to be advertised. Cultural events not happening, you're not going to advertise and stuff like this. Um, so it's a, it's a strange combination of, of reduced revenues and higher figures. On top of this, in relation to funding implications, we also were informed of a few uh, staff cuts from public service broadcasters. Um, yeah, so I mean, there, there will there looks to be already knock on effects uh, in, in terms of financial issues. 
Um, yeah, so moving on to um, other content. So whilst the pandemic related news increased audience figures, the other the effects on other content were, were more mixed, sometimes negative. So a lot of minority language media cover uh, sports and cultural events. Uh, so we, we were informed in the case of the Irish, Frisian and Basque TV, um, a lot of these cancellations led to instead reruns of old programs, which is not as uh, desirable for the audience. And thus in those instances, lowered uh, audience figures. Um, some newspapers decided to cut the number of printed pages um, because of a lack of a lack of other content going on in society. Um, however, this this was there were yeah lost my thought here. There were also um, positive effects on other content. Uh, so, for example, um, many minority communities shifted their cultural events online, so content could could stay for for it, for the media, but also media produced their own uh, unique content based on on the events of the pandemic. Um, so here we saw um, so a lot of user interactive shows, user generated content, um, both on TV, also um, Life Under Lockdown podcast on Irish radio um, and similar stuff on Catalan TV. Um, so this is, this is examples of how minority language media adapted to the changing uh, circumstances with with new and fresh content. Um, so moving on to majority minority relations, um, we didn't find so so much strict uh, answers here, but there are many examples of of small aspects which. Um, some some positive, some negative. So we found uh, that there was sometimes a lack of minority language uh, announcements or uh, language not being used in instances where it previously had. So in the case of Frisian in the Netherlands, uh, the health minister who usually spoke on Frisian TV in Frisian switched to Dutch under the under the pandemic uh, with. And during the lockdown and then switch back to Frisian afterwards with no explanation given. Um, in Ireland, we saw that no Irish language health announcements were given. Um, another example which was highlighted was that um, the national carrier of fin Finland, Finnair, only gave um, travel updates in English and Finnish, despite Swedish being a official state language in Finland. Uh, so there were some alarming aspects at how quickly uh, minority languages disappeared or were not covered um, or seen as a priority. However, there were some positive examples here. Um, we saw um, examples of Welsh ministers taking questions in English uh, and Welsh. And so this provided content for Welsh news and Welsh social media. Um, there was an instance in, in, in Finland whereby the Swedish speaking ministers of government were giving bilingual press conferences at the beginning, um, which was suggested that to, to be an example where uh, Swedish media was covered in, Swedish language media was covered in, in Finnish um, spaces where it normally wouldn't. Although this, this was, this changed, it was, seen as a positive example of how to to give some space to the to the minority language and then finally um, there was an example of Scottish Gaelic language productions being um, reviewed in mainstream English media um, for their innovative uh, content um, and general positivity 
towards them, which is not often seen and sort of ex can expose uh, non-speakers to the language in instances where they not hadn't been in the past. Uh, so yeah, basically increasing awareness of minority languages in a in a in a unique time period. Um, in terms of logistical uh, aspects, of course, this was similar for for most media, but um, there was and actually for many parts of society, there was the fresh challenge of working from home or socially distanced. Um, staff had to to go out into the field with health precautions. So it definitely sort of required a change, which when you're often small um, or smallly funded media outlets, uh, this can be tricky in terms of tr retraining staff and, and things like that. Um, but yet there was a couple of mentions from different um, expert interviewees where they suggested that these, these changes may be um, irreversible or, or at least have, have allowed certain media to, to modernize and use um, technology going forward. Um, yeah, and in, in this context, there was also um, BBC Alba in Scotland uh, used um, user-generated videos and reports of Gaelic speakers where its journalists were struggling to work in remote areas. And this provided a lot of content for news um, to ease, ease the logistical issues. Um, there was also an instance of the, the West Highlands Free Press going online only due to the lockdown measures in the spring, um, but they did keep their limited uh, Gaelic content. Um, we also saw a few job cuts, temporary staff reduction, hours cuts in, in different examples, um, which uh, again, whilst these situations are not unique to minority language media, should be emphasized that oftentimes such institutions are the only uh, media outlets operating in a given language. And so, reducing their production cap capacity or or even their total disappearance can significantly affect minority communities themselves. Um, so these these challenges should be seen in in a, in the light of um, particularly precarious situations for for minority languages, which remains to be seen how the long-term effects of this are. So finally, on to social media. Um, yes, so generally audience figures increased um, and most minority language media outlets with a presence on social media saw an increased engagement during the months. Uh, higher number of likes, followers, retweets, um, and obviously, this is quite measurable because there's often data available for from the social media companies um, on on how the numbers have changed. Whereas this can be more tricky in terms of TV or radio. Um, but what was interesting from a unique perspective is that um, in a couple of instances there was increased engagement from kin states. So in Swedish media in Finland. Um, some of the media, traditional media outlets saw an engagement from Swedish uh, speakers in Sweden um, engaging backwards to, to Finland to, to see information uh, on, the, on the pandemic. And similarly, we saw the example of um, the majority population uh, looking at minority media, language media on social media. Uh, this was an example in, in, in Denmark with the German uh, minority newspaper seeing an increase in, in Danish speaking followers, um, again, possibly looking to, to find out local information that the, 
regional newspaper was was providing. Um, so in this sense, it's perhaps surprisingly, the pandemic has contributed to um, interaction between majority and minority, which may not normally occur. Um, finally, on social media, uh, there were instances where social media groups were set up during the pandemic to share practical information or personal experiences in a minority language. So for example, um, tips on how to deal with coronavirus in a spread in a minority language um, discussion, and that, but also innovative groups such as beating the coronavirus through cooking uh, in Welsh and singing groups, etc. So there was really a lot of um, pastime activities in minority language set up obviously in the context of a lockdown people have a lot of spare time uh, sat in front of a computer and it was interesting to observe that social media has provided um, opportunities for minority languages to or minority language speakers to to communicate with one another okay so that brings me through to the conclusion slide um, so, I mean, to summarize, minority language media spheres have clearly all been affected by the COVID pandemic and the lockdown measures, however, to varying degrees. So there's a lot of challenges and opportunities, some of which are unique to minority language media and some of them also faced by majority media. But with the caveat that minority language media often have a, a more sort of crucial role in local communities, whereby if they're the only media outlet, then an existential crisis for the media becomes an existential crisis for the language, potentially. Um, particularly, yeah, lower revenues. However, despite this short-term threat, um, the increased audiences potentially offers an opportunity in the long term to, to grow the audience and potentially uh, the minority language speakers. So it, it remains to be seen how this affects uh, the long term future of minority language media outlets um, and also the general societal cohesion between majority and minority speakers. I think it was interesting to observe a lot of new content, pandemic inspired programs, um, social media groups, which may uh, last beyond Corona um, and provide new opportunities for individuals. However, I will just say a little bit about the further research and limitations of, of this um, analysis. So firstly, we have the effects of a second wave of the pandemic, which we're currently currently in, or at least in a second wave of lockdowns. Um, and so we don't know at this stage whether the situation may get worse in terms of finances, um, or the situation might be improved in the sense that the experience of the first lockdown helps um, to deal with the logistical and programming uh, issues this time around. And so really, it's our intention to return to this research in the spring, um, potentially return to the same expert uh, interviewees and ask almost the same questions again and see how things have changed. Um, Obviously, yeah, there's a small sample size here. We're just looking at 10 spheres, although um, the number of outlets is, is more than that. It's still limited on the European scale. So um, something we want to do is to really look into expanding the series or at least expanding the research, whether this be now or, or in 2021, just to incre increase um, comparison with Central and Eastern Europe, for example. Um, yes, so stay tuned in that sense. Uh, we will hopefully return to this. Um, I should say that uh, 
all of the interviews are on the ECMI's website in full, usually around 1,500 to 2,000 words. Um, and I would encourage you to go and read, read them all or some of them if, if you have the um, time, because they really can go into much more detail than I've been able to hear in terms of specific effects, um, specific programs that have been created. You can, you, there, there's a lot of hyperlinks to, to programs um, and to, to information for, for each of these. Uh, you can find that on the ECMI's website, ecmi.de, uh, um, and search minority language media. And yes, I will at this stage stop and say thank you, firstly, to Natasha and the audience, um, as well as the organizers of, of the conference in Novi Sad. Uh, like I said, it's a shame this can't take place in person, but hopefully next year or in the future, there's an opportunity for, for me to, to meet and discuss such aspects. Um, yeah, thanks to everybody who's watching and listening to this. Uh, I would very much welcome hearing your thoughts, questions, comments. My two email addresses are there. Please get in touch and uh, hopefully we will have the chance to to talk. Okay, so I'll stop sharing my screen and sign up. Thank you very much.